Hi everyone, thank you so much for keeping up with the New Times. Today, I'm joined by Erika Mbanda. You know her as an Instagram influencer, but she's also a pretty good entrepreneur that has like a unique perspective and I'm so excited to get to do this. So Erika, how are you? I'm doing well, very well. Great, it's so nice to have you. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having me. <laughs> Thank you. The public knows you as an Instagram influencer but you're also an entrepreneur and yeah. you've had like a whole life before you were like this Instagram influencer. So tell me a little bit, like yeah. who is Erika Mbanda? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very sure. happy to be here. Um, so who is Erika Mbanda? Uh, I am a mother, I am a wife, I have two children. Um, I've been living in Rwanda for the past nine and a half years, which is crazy. It's been, that's feels like such a long time, but it's gone by really, really fast. Um, I was born in the U.S. in Denver, Colorado, and so I'm American. I'm also Rwandan. Um, my a bit about my background, I guess. So, yeah, so um, when did you when did you move to Rwanda? I moved to Rwanda in October, September of 2013. Wow, so it's going to be ten. Actually, yeah, it's going to be ten years in September. Happy ten year anniversary! We're getting there. You know? <laughs> So how how is it like transitioning from the U.S. to Rwanda? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think, you know, it feels like so long ago. Um, but I do remember like my first year just being um, really hard, like just trying to find my footings and what it was that I was doing, being in a country that I had never lived in, um, always heard about and, and knew about my, my roots and, and where we're from as a family. Um, but I didn't know the language and so I was having to learn the language and navigate mm -hmm. through Kigali, make friends and making friends when you're older is not, not so easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, just trying to find ways to, to make friends and meet people. Um, so the first year was, was tough, to be honest. It was really hard, but I had committed that I was going to come to Rwanda and work for two years mm -hmm. before making any decisions whether I was going to stay or go back to the U.S. And after the two years, I just felt like I don't, like, I don't want to leave. I actually, I actually love it here. So you know? I, here I am, nine and a half years it's, later. It can be pretty hard to make friends in, the, in a new place when, you don't, when you're not going to school. Because yeah. it's easier with school. Because exactly. You get to interact with exactly. people. Like you, you're, you, you actually have to be in the same place yeah. always. Speaking of school, how did that go for you? Mm. So my school background, I did, the, I did my university. I actually did all my schooling in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so in university, I studied uh, psychology and sociology it was my undergrad. Um, I did a pre-med track because I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. um, and in my third year of university, I just realized, I don't think this is really what I want to do. I actually am really passionate about counseling um, and working with women. And so I did my master's in counseling. Wow. So I counseled for a couple years, but I was doing that while working in for a nonprofit organization and I was doing marketing and donor relations. Um, so when you look at my CV, it's like all over the place. <laughs> I always say that I'm a jack of all trades. Um, and so, yeah, I've done a lot uh, in construction. I've done HR. Yeah. Um, I've worked in uh, development work. If it's doable, you've done it. Yeah, I guess so, pretty much. <laughs> and I think for me, it's really just been about um, a lot of, like I never applied for a job until I moved to Rwanda, actually. Mm -hmm. I never like physically like gone and applied for a job. So it's usually been, um, you know, a connection. So meeting someone who tells me about an opportunity and then I apply. But usually it's been opportunities presented to me and mm -hmm. I find it interesting and so then I I go for it, and then it's a new opportunity to learn a new skill, um, to develop myself a bit more. But I think through all the jobs that I've done, there's been like transferable skills that I can see throughout all of them. And it's really about working with people. So I've been pretty good about working with people, having organizational skills. And so I find myself in a lot of administrative type um, or operations or people management type of roles. So basically what I'm hearing is you're living that boss life. I'm living the boss life. I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> now so, um, I am. <laughs> your last known um, corporate job was as a country manager, mm. which you left to chase your dreams to be yeah. a baker. So take me through the process. I mean, now that I've heard about your schooling, 
I can tell you're really not a you're, you're really not about settling because living med school mm-hmm. med school. I to, I was pre med so I didn't do med school quite yet, but living yeah. pre med to go do psychology after three years. Yeah, like that's a pretty ballsy move so it's not yeah. like now 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 that i know about that it's not like something new like it's something i would expect yeah so take me through the process when did you like what was it like working there at first when did you when did you realize you were falling out of love with it like what tell me about the moment when you were like i'm done yeah my dreams are it yeah yeah it's it's first of all it's really interesting how you you've said you know, you've kind of taken me back to even university and mm-hmm. making that ballsy move. And it's just reminding me that I think all my life, like I've, I've reached a point where I'm like, this isn't like, I, I want to follow my heart and what it is that I feel called to do. Mm-hmm. And so then I take a step. And usually that step is really a step of faith because I really don't know what's on the other side. So even, you know, back in school, it was like, I don't think pre-med is what I want to do. Let me do counseling. So I shifted to that. At some point it was, you know, I don't think I want to stay in the U.S. and, you know, finish my career here. I really feel like I want to go back to Rwanda, know my country, um, learn the language and just spend time there. And it helped that my parents were also here. So I, but that was also a step of faith, to be honest. Um, and so now going to, to this job, here in Rwanda, I have three jobs, actually. I was working in construction, and then um, I worked for an energy company. So I was doing operations for an energy company, and then I moved into um, a social enterprise called Harambi. You were and not working those jobs at the same time, right? Not at the same time, no. <laughs> that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Yes, not at the same time. Mm-hmm. But I, I did have Mkaitina Bata, which I'll, I'll go to that in a bit. Mm-hmm. But um, so my third job was with Harambi, and I was the country representative. Um, we worked, um, it was basically in youth employment. Um, and I, I loved the job. I really loved the job. I loved what I was doing. I love when I can work and feel like it's making impact Mm -hmm. and you can visibly see the impact that you're making. And so that was something that was really important to me in all the jobs that I was doing is just feeling like there's impact being made. Cause at some points you just, you know, the work becomes hard. It becomes mundane sometimes or tedious, but if you can feel like, okay, there's impact being made, I think it helps to continue doing something that so now might I'm be hard. I'm curious, cause if it felt like impact, if you actually loved it, then how, how, how did you come to the decision of being yeah. like, no, this doesn't serve me anymore. This is yeah. not for me anymore. Yeah. So I had my first child. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I had my first child, uh, Sayla. And I just realized that time was passing by so fast. First of all, I, I had to go back to work when she was four months. And that was really, really hard for me um, to separate from her and to, to trust you know, her with somebody else at home. I didn't feel like I was ready to go back to work. I was dealing with postpartum. Um, and so there was just so many factors. Um, so I went back to work and I really struggled for you know, the first like two, three months. I had a lot of just imposter syndrome, like I just, felt like I wasn't the leader that I was before I had my daughter. I felt like I wasn't as capable as I was before. And a lot of it was just in my mind, you know, Mm -hmm. and things that I was struggling with, but it was very real to me. And going back and I talked to people, they didn't even see like in my actions or what I was doing, they couldn't really tell what was going on. So they're actually even shocked. So a lot of it was really internal. Um, And then it was that year, it was 2020. So Mm -hmm. COVID, Um, we went into lockdown. And during lockdown, I spent, so it was kind of a blessing in disguise, actually, because I went back to work in about November of that year. And then in March was the lockdown. So I only had a few months where I was navigating going to work and everything that I was dealing with, which was really hard. But when um, the lockdown lockdown happened, and honestly, for me, I was one of those people that loved the lockdown. I was so happy. I was just like, I get to be home. I'm a homebody. Like people see me as an extrovert. I, I do love people, but I'm an introverted extrovert so for me it was like I get to be home and not have to go out and see people (laughs) and spend time with my daughter and spend time with my husband my husband was going a bit crazy because he's just you know for him he wants to be out and and an extrovert Mm -hmm. Um, so during that time I really had a lot of time to reflect and in that reflection I just asked myself I wanted to get back to the root of who is Erica what are my passions? What do I love? Um, what don't I love? Mm-hmm. Where do I want to spend my time? Mm-hmm. What fills my cup? You know, I felt at that point, I felt like I was drained. 
I felt like I was drained. I was just giving, giving, giving. So one, I'm giving to this newborn child. I'm giving to my work. And so I felt like I just, I felt empty all the time. So when I did that evaluation, I just realized that something that I really love to do is I, I love baking. And mm -hmm. now Mukati no Bata, I actually started it in 2014. So right after I moved with my roommate at the time. So we started it together and really it was for us to just kind of meet people. So we would host people for brunches at home. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how Mukati no Bata started because people would come home wow. and they're like, those cupcakes are really good. Oh, those cookies. Can I have these cupcakes for my mom's birthday? And so from there, we both were like, this is an opportunity for us to actually start mm -hmm. a home business. bakery. Mm -hmm. So we started a home bakery and that's kind of how Mukati no Bata started. So a lot of people, you know, they see Mukati no Bata because I reopened it in um, 2020. So right after the lockdown. Mm -hmm. But we actually had, most people knew about us from back in 2014. So in 2014, we ran the business for two years, which is why I said that I was working my jobs and also having Mukati no Bata as my passion on the side. So my mm -hmm. roommate and I, we're baking after work in the middle of the night on the weekends. Wow. I look back and I'm like, how did we have that time to do all of those things? Like right now, I just feel like I'm chasing after time all the time. Right. And I have no like, idea how we managed to do like, all of that. Let me know when you find the bank where we can get extra time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how is For the work, sure. I want to call it a work-love balance, mm -hmm. not like a work-life balance. How is the work-love balance? Love being the baking and yeah. the work being the Joy. Yeah, I love how you said that, work-love balance. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to start using that. Um, you know, I, I can't say we. I got it perfect all the time. I think there's times where you, you're, you're doing well, and then there's other times where you're not. And I think the key to that is really just checking in with yourself constantly. To be mm -hmm. honest, the work-love balance, as you say, was, go was really, really amazing in the beginning. You know, I felt like we were tackling so much. I was traveling for my work, but we had Mukaisi no Bata. It was amazing. And when it got to around 2016, mm -hmm. um, 2015, 2016 is where it was like, I actually, this passion that I loved, I actually hate. Like, it's draining me. It's exhausting. I don't have time for it. And so that's when we decided to take a pause and pause the business. So when I reopened it in 2020, it was really, um, I wanted to make sure that I do what I have the capacity for. And so I knew that I wanted to bake again. I knew that I wanted to reopen the business and to serve people treats and joy through the treats. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that I'm one person. I can't do as much as we were doing before. I can't live up to the expectations of maybe what people want. Because a lot of times when you start something, you're like, oh, you should do this. You should do that. Like, have you thought about making more cake options? Have you thought about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? And yes, Breaking I think about it all the time. Expectation is the way to go. Sorry? Breaking up with expectation is the yeah. way to go. Yeah, because it can drive you crazy. I mean, you can find that you're actually making decisions based on what people, like people are driving you. And I think that there's a healthy balance of hearing what people want and what the demand is. But then you also have to go back and realize, what am I capable of doing? So in 2020, I was really intentional about that work-love balance because I knew I wanted to go back into my passion of bringing up the business, but I was working full-time too. Mm -hmm. And I was getting my coaching certification at the same time. So I was like, wow. okay, how do I do this to still be able to enjoy my passion, but not let it get to a place where I'm just losing my marbles. I can't, I can't deal with anything. So I set up systems to where I was like, okay, I can take orders on, I'll, I'll announce a menu on Monday. I'll take orders on Thursday and people will pick up their treats on Saturday or Sunday. And that's it. And if people don't place their order by Thursday at five, then they can't have an order. And it was really hard for me because I'm, I'm a people pleaser. And so you'd get calls like, please, please, please make an exception. It's my mom's birthday. It's this, it's that. And I always felt like I should just say yes. But I had to do a hard stop because I said in the beginning, it's easy to say yes because you can manage it. But then you find yourself six months later, like someone can ask you for one little exception and it just like you're about to lose it, right? Because you're just so exhausted. So I really wanted to make sure I protected the work love balance mm -hmm. and I would grow organically and naturally and bring people to help me on the way. Tell me about bonding the work-love balance, like making it one. Making it one. Huh. So first is the relationship and now we got married. Yeah. So, wow. I'm not sure I know how to answer that. I. Like what was it like uh, not being the country director anymore? Mm. 
and just doing this yeah what was that transition like yeah so yeah let me maybe talk a little bit about so as you know i was doing my coaching certification and during that i realized okay i have my daughter i want to have more flexibility i feel like Mkwetsin Abata is something that I can do and do it on my own time and still be able to invest time in my daughter's life, which is what I really wanted to do. Again, like I said, I loved my job and what I was doing was making impact, but it was taking a lot of time away from what I was prioritizing, which was my family. Mm -hmm. um, and so I realized through the coaching program and actually coaching myself, I realized that what I really truly wanted to do was to be an entrepreneur. I truly wanted to have, because I knew that I want to be a working mom. I still need to, I can't be, I didn't want to be a stay at home mom, but I wanted to work on my own terms. I wanted to be able to take off three weeks if I need to. Um, I wanted to be able to not work during the day and then work more at night, you know, to cover for what I was able to do. So I wanted that flexibility. Um, and so that's when I, in the summer actually, in around July is when I realized, okay, what I want to do is truly be home and start my business and not work anymore. And it was hard because of course I had all these thoughts like, how am I going to get money? How are we going to, as a family, like, can we afford that, you know, to lose a, a whole income? There's also a piece of like, my identity was wrapped up into what I was doing. Um, so it was like, if I take away country representative for Harambi, who is Erica? Like, who is Erica? You know, what do I say? Mm -hmm. When people ask me, what do you do? What am I going to, I bake, like I bake for my house and, you know, send treats to people. So a lot of my identity of who I was, was wrapped up into my work. And then the second thing, it was a really good paying job. Like it was, it was supporting my family. I was able to make savings. Like it was a great job. So everything on paper was like, you love your job. You have a great job position. You're making good money. So why would you quit? But again, it was like, it's not my passion. My passion is this, and I want to spend more time at home. So I, I just had, that was again, a leap of faith. I can't say I did it in the best way because afterwards is where I was just like, oh my gosh, okay, now we're struggling financially, so what do we do? Now we're here, um, we don't know what to do. Exactly, but I had already jumped. It's like, you can't, I mean, now you, you just need to swim. It. Yeah, you can't undo it. Sink or swim. Sink or swim, yeah. So at that point, I feel like that's when I was married to, to, to this thing, and this business brings me so much joy. I love it so much, but at the same time, it's also like, <laughs> can be the biggest stressor <laughs> in my life. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I wanted something that would give me more time and prioritize home. But to be honest, being an entrepreneur, that it's actually like I've worked more than in my previous jobs. Wow. Um, and so you have to be intentional about making sure that it's not the, the one thing that you loved and the one thing that you're passionate about is not also the same thing that's going to pull you away from what your priority is. And that's a daily choice that I have to make. Of course, it's not always going to be 50-50, like exact. There's sometimes where, you know, opening up this cafe, I really had to be here a lot. My husband was really pulling a lot of weight at home. Um, I would get home late. But then now things are running really well. I have a great team and so I'm able to do more at home. So when you look at the course of the year, I'm looking at having that balance mm -hmm. around everything and focusing more on quality time than quantity, right? So more when I have those one hour quantity. with my daughter, mm -hmm. I'll give her that one hour, be intentional and she'll love it. And she won't remember the four days before that I was too busy to put her to bed or whatever. That is was, so sweet. So. So has has the, has has it has it how has it actually paid off, in terms of like, of course I can tell you've pulled yourself up by, by the bootstraps financially, mm -hmm. but like in actual sense, how has it paid off? And is this something you would recommend somebody to do? Yeah, somebody who really doesn't like their job and mm -hmm. has something they're passionate about that that is actually within their ability to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think in terms of paying off, it's paying off because it's truly something that brings me joy. I feel fulfilled. I feel like I'm operating in my passions and what I love. Um, I'm learning a lot. Like I've learned new skills. I've learned more about myself, especially as an entrepreneur. I never thought I was an entrepreneur actually. Um, so I've learned a lot about myself as an entrepreneur. Um, it hasn't paid off financially. I'm still waiting for those checks to come in. So buy more treats. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But 
it's it's something I feel fulfilled in so many other areas. And now I'm at a point where, okay, I could still have this passion and maybe I do some other work and consultancies that's gonna bring in some money while I continue to do this thing that I love. In terms of if I recommend it for other people, I, I recommend for everyone to identify and try to know what it is that you are passionate about, what it is that you love to do. Um, not everyone has to quit their job and follow your passions. You could work a nine to five, work your job and still fulfill your passions. And I think once you, the first step is really to identify what it is that you want to do or what do you love, what brings you joy. I think that's something that everyone should ask themselves. Um, and then I think it's starting small because sometimes I did it myself too. It's like, I need all this money. Like if I want to open up Mukai Tinabata, I need to have a store and I need to have this and this. So I, I need to start off with $10,000 or whatever it is. And so now that thinking prevents you from actually doing it. Cause now you're like, well, I don't have the money, so I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Or I don't have the time, so I can't do it. My job takes up so much time. There's no way I could start this business. But when I say like break it down and start small, it's what can you do? So for me, I could bake on the weekends. So I'm gonna bake on the weekends. I can't mm -hmm. afford a nice oven, so I'm gonna use my oven at home. Um, so I think for, for everyone, it's what is your passion? If you're working a full-time job, how can you carve out time to do those things? And it's all about prioritization. Because if you really look into it, you'll see that, yeah, your job might be draining, but when you, don't, when you have some free time, what are you doing, right? And maybe mm -hmm. we're like hanging out with friends Maybe we're sleeping, <laughs> maybe we're watching Netflix, maybe we're, I don't know, there's lots of things that we're doing. And when you really identify that, you're able to see, okay, if I could just take one hour a week to focus on my passion. If you like to write, one hour a week to write. If you like to bake, bake. If you like to dance, dance. You know Whatever what? it is, and slowly you'll find that you will make more time for that thing Mm -hmm. And then opportunities will come. Maybe there's someone that's going to give you some money to buy something small to, to make it bigger. And that's where you have that organic growth. And at some point, you'll then have that exponential growth. You know what I'm relating this to? It's like you're starting a relationship with your passion, but you're, you're going on dates first, getting to know <laughs> each other. You're not moving in immediately. Yeah. <laughs> so you take it step by step by yeah. step until finally you're bonded for yeah, life, yeah. you know? I'm sure everybody who, who knows you prior have, has noticed, but you've been an Instagram influencer for a while. You've been sharing, you've been sharing lifestyle tips, mom tips, and I want to know where that came from. Is it from like your experiences and what prompted you to share? Because you, you feel, you mentioned being a people pleaser in terms of like business. Yeah. And Randa has this like stigma of people who, of who overshare. Share, overshare. <laughs> People, people, who, <laughs> people who overshare their lives, yeah. especially their struggles. Yeah. I mean, I feel like people can learn lessons from you. How has it like reflected back to yeah. you? Like, what what has been the aftermath? How has it been perceived? Yeah. And is it impacting the business? Yeah. Ah, oh, it's a great question. Um, it's a loaded question, to be honest. I could talk about this for like ten hours, but I'm not going to do that. I think the short of it is that. I haven't always been like this. I've actually always been, for the longest time that I can remember, one that wants to like hide behind the curtain, right? So I want to be doing all this work. That's why I like even operations or whatever, you know, I'm doing the operations, I'm running something, but I want someone else to be the face of it. And that's how I was for the longest time. Mm -hmm. um, I think the short of it is I've always been on the side of just receiving. So I see other people that are sharing and I'm learning from them. I'm feeling seen. I'm like, wow, they really like what they're saying is so relatable. And that's helped me. It's helped me in my confidence. It's helped me in following my aspirations, my dreams, my passions. It's helped me grow. <laughs> like it's really helped me grow as an individual, hearing stories and being inspired by other people. And at some point, I felt like God was like, you've been in this seat for too long. I want you to go on to the other side. Like I you have you to something be to share. on the other side of the mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was scary for me because it's like, huh? Like I'm good. And for me, it was just more like, but I'm not ready. I'm not ready, you know? Mm -hmm. But again, it was that comparison. Why am I not ready? It's because I want to be like so-and-so who's doing this. The way that they talk, the way that they put their content out, the way that they, like I was so focused on, I need to work really hard to be like them mm -hmm. before I can actually have this platform to do this. 
And so I fought a lot back and forth with God, like, mm, I can't. And I think it's, I know it's very interesting. Like I felt like I started doing it, especially on social media, without really like being intentional, like knowing what I was doing. So it was more like, I'm just sharing a little bit here and there. At some point I was like, you know what? I'm gonna make my, my page public. I never thought that it would be where I am right now today. I like never in my mind. I think even, I, I don't know if influencing was a thing back then in 2013, 14. I think that's when I really started being a bit more active okay. with, my, with my social media and a bit open about my journey. Where I was a bit more open and more vulnerable, I think is when I got married. Because I got married and I realized like, wow, marriage was not what, it's what I thought it was and it's not what I thought it was. So I dealt with like some challenges and I felt like, oh my gosh, like everyone looks like their marriage is fine and fun and everything's perfect and great, right? Because again, you're looking at people and you're like, hey, do y'all do y'all fight? Do you guys have issues? Is, you know, what's you know? going on? So I felt really alone and some of the challenges that I was dealing with. So again, I went back to consuming all this content, reading about things and relating to others. But I realized that these are people in the West and these are people outside of the continent. And you know, they're not like, I didn't, I didn't hear anyone here like actually sharing about what they were going through and some of the struggles. And so for me, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start sharing one, cause in that sharing was actually very healing for me. Cause it was mm -hmm. like, I'm putting this out there because I just want one, I want to be real with myself. I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be seen as like everything's perfect and yet it's not. Because that incongruence of what people were seeing and what was actually going on inside was like eating me alive. Lie. And then exactly. And then you start like living this lie and then, and then that's when you lose yourself. You're like who, like who am I? What do I enjoy? What do I love? So it started out with that, like with marriage. So I was sharing a bit more about marriage and like the power of counseling. And that was like, eh? she's talking about therapy. Like her and her husband go to therapy, what's wrong? Like what's so bad that they have to go to therapy, right? Mm -hmm. And those are some of the questions I was getting. And even advice from some friends of like, you know what, like it's good that you go to counseling, but maybe no, don't put it out there. Cause when you put it out there, you're giving someone a reason to talk more, right? And so now people are gonna be like, why do they have to go to counseling? What's going on? And so gossip starts and, and whatnot. But I had to just not focus on that and focus on the good. Cause when I started sharing, I got so many messages from people just opening up about their struggles, what's going on and the fact that they felt seen and they felt heard. And so I just felt like, okay, like I think this is what I need to do more and more and more of. So again, that journey wasn't for me to become an influencer or to have all the followers that I have now. I think it's been, if you look at my journey and going back, it's really been like the steady organic growth until recently, where it's just kind of blown up. I don't know why. <laughs> But um, yeah, to answer your question, it's not easy, um, but it is very rewarding. I feel, again, I feel like I really am learning more about my gifts. Like I never saw myself as a speaker. I never saw myself as a entertainer. Like, really? I find that hard no, to believe. I know people say that. Like, and people, in, when I was working in Harambe, those, those people know. Like the way I had to go on panels to speak or to share, I was always just like, let, this is an opportunity for me to develop my team <laughs> and let me give them the opportunity to do it. But really what I was doing is I was shying away from doing that. Because again, I was focused on, I need to be this way in order to be good. Mm -hmm. And until I let that go and I was like, I'm gonna show up as me. Now I still get nervous, but I'm more comfortable because I'm like, all I can do is show up as Erica. And if Erica is goofy as Erica, if Erica's gonna do some crazy reels, if Erica's gonna overshare, that's what I'm gonna do because that's what's natural, that's what feels good. When I, when I feel like I need to be like this and don't talk about like, you know, open up about vulnerability, but don't share too much, don't overshare. That's when I start overthinking and then I just, it's awkward and I'm not natural and people can pick up on that. So for me, it's like, I just wanna show up as me and who I am. And I think that that's benefited me because people want that. People are actually really craving authenticity. People are craving something that they can relate to. Um, which is why it's interesting that here in Rwanda, where it's not so natural to just be so open or to share about your hardships, to share that you have bad days, to share that you cry, <laughs> I cry on, on, in, in public. Um, and yet, like that's what most people will say, but yet the majority of my followers <laughs> are Rwandans. The majority of the comments that I get or the things that people are sharing are Rwandans. So it shows me that 
we're, we, we want that. We maybe just don't know how to put ourselves out there. And it doesn't mean that everyone has to put themselves out there on a platform. Um, and I say that all the time. I just want people to be able to share their real self with somebody else, even if that's one other person. I think that's so much, that's so powerful because you're able to like release and just be like, I could just be me and people can still love me. You know? Yeah. So er finding out that Erica is who represents Erica best has actually impacted a whole movement. I guess so. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm trying to embrace the influencer world because I've, I've ran away from that. But now I see it more as, you know, in this summer, I told my husband, I was like, I really feel like God has given me a platform. And my goal is just to use this for good. I want to inspire people. I want to motivate people. I want people to feel seen and heard. And so I'm going to continue doing that, even at the detriment that there's still hard parts. There's still the personal attacks. There's still people judging why you're doing what you're doing. And I just have to put myself on guard. Like literally every morning when I say my prayers, I'm just like, God, like help me focus on the good, on the beauty and not on the negative stuff. Because naturally I'll go. I can go onto a post that I, that I put out there and there's like a hundred beautiful, amazing comments that are inspiring. And, and, then, there's and then there's that one, one comment stupid comments <laughs> that you're like why and yet that can bring me down that can actually even make me question like should i keep doing this is it worth it right and mm -hmm. i don't want to focus on those things i know it's coming i know it'll come probably even more which is a bit scary for me but i really feel like i'm doing something that i was called to do and something that i love to do and so it helps me to endure it's like entrepreneurship you start something that you really love you're met with challenges you have to close your business, you don't have money, your staff is leaving, whatever it is, but yet you still wake up and say, I'm gonna tackle this, why? It's because you love it, it's because you're passionate about it, and so you're gonna keep pushing through the hard, but it's worth it, right? That's what love is. That's what love is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My marriage bond, right, as you said. You know? <laughs> so I'm married to two people, huh? <laughs> My husband and then my business. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it, it's an, it's, it's a three-way. <laughs> It's a three-way. I've always thought of my business as a baby, actually. It's still a baby because I'm still carrying it. I just can't wait till the time that my, my baby can just run and doesn't mm -hmm. really need me there. Mm -hmm. Right now, I still feel like I'm nurturing. I'm still, you know, and I can't wait for the time that I can just watch it grow and, yeah, to for the team to grow, for somebody else to take it over. I feel That's really like my your ultimate baby goal. Is, a has, is a twin now. As a twin. Because there is there is the cafe, the baking, yeah. and then there is the influencing. Yeah. So how does the, how 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 does everybody in the relationship feel about each other? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, we know you're in love. <laughs> is there jealousy? <laughs> Is, is, is there jealousy? Is there backlash? Yeah. Is there support? It's like consistent support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm so curious. Yeah. And the people want to know. I've, I've actually had to ask myself that question because to be honest, I feel right now like I just have so much on my plate. While I love everything, I still also believe that you can have too much of a good thing. So sometimes you are always like, you put too much on your plate and just take away the things that, you know, are not filling you up, are not enjoyable. But to be honest, like everything is filling me. Like I love all of it, but I don't have the capacity for all of it. And so, you know, and it's okay to, to outgrow something. And so I think I've been so attached to this baby, which is Mukatsu no Vata, um, always thinking that I was gonna be like in the kitchen and baking. And to be honest, like now for the past year and a half, I don't think I've baked a single thing from Mukatsu no Bata. Wow. Like I've developed a team, they do all the baking. Um, I even have an amazing cake decorator who does most of the decorations, even for wedding cakes as of late, she's been doing all of that. And so I realized that right now I'm shifting to, I actually wanna build a team. I actually want to grow a team that can do this on their own. And I would love to sit as a shareholder who is just like, here are some ideas maybe focus on expansion. So think other things that I'd love to do, uh, would love to do with the business, but really have mm -hmm. a strong team that can run it. And so that's really what I'm working towards right now is just focusing on how I can have this baby just run on its own so that I can focus on content and coaching, which is really now, like that's what I really want to do is I want to coach, I want to work with people, journey with people that are, you know, in transitions and figuring out and transition can be everything it could be transitioning out of work into entrepreneurship it could be transitioning into motherhood it could be transitioning into out of school and now you're looking for your career 
I think that we all go through transitions in life. It's not, um, I don't know, it's not just a linear, we kind of all move around. So I want to help people to navigate those transitions. And I think in navigating those transitions, you need to know yourself and you need to have the confidence to be able to walk through that transition. And so for me, it's, I really want to work with people on how they can know themselves more and how they can have confidence to tackle whatever it is that they would like. Wow, that's um, So amazing. that's what I want to focus on, which kind of marries with the content that I do because it's really around marriage and motherhood, um, lifestyle, self-love. And yeah, I think those are the two things that I really want to focus I, on. I don't know if you realize this, but you're still doing the whole all-round thing. If it's doable, I'm doing it. <laughs> Even with the content creation, honestly. Yeah. It's been so nice having you. Thank you for thank you for making the time. This has been a great conversation. Till next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>